us. So we started for her career elsewhere and told her where to go away. And uh, we now move on to someone who started his career in Galway and we ended up somewhere else. Um, so uh, Stephen Green uh, is currently an assistant professor in Trinity. And uh, starting out his, his chemical career in NUI Galway, with doing his BSE uh, and then his PhD in Galway uh, in the Bush Chemistry Group. Um, and then he moved on uh, to a postdoc in uh, Princeton, uh, sometime working in industry in a part of Cummins Engine Company uh, before moving to UL and uh, on to his current position. So Steve is going to talk to us about the views we make in Tallinn. Thanks for the approach and thanks for the invite to come back here. Um, first time back here in a small I think. It's very nice, it's a very nice idea to have this composer. I'm going to try and uh, this is the suggested title, um, but I will try to address the suggested title. Um, I'm essentially a fuel chemist, an energy chemist. Um, I mean, it's always been fuel. I never thought really ever end up uh, studying sugar, uh, but they end up being uh, very available and affordable uh, resource of carbon and hydrogen. And that's what we need to have in the fuel, an uh, affordable source of carbon and hydrogen. So this brought me to study the sugar. My motivation has uh, always been about transportation energy. Um, so in the EU, it's about a third of our energy innovation. Contributes uh, burning of fuel, contributes to transportation fuel, contributes about a quarter of global CO2 emissions. So it's a very important uh, issue that we can compromise this now. Uh, to do that, so we have been relying on what are called first generation biofuels. Uh, so those are things that are often non fossil, uh, but they come from uh, food resources. So principally, uh, uh, non paleolithic sugar, um, make ethanol, and then fats and oils uh, to make methyl ethyl biofuels. Uh, the game has changed in Europe. Um, in the last 12 months or so, we have the revised renewable energy directive, and that is capping first generation biofuels at 10% of uh, total energy utilization for transport. We have to somehow uh, make what are called advanced biofuels. Uh, by 2030, we need 3.5% of our energy from advanced biofuels. In a simple definition, an advanced biofuel is obviously, again, non fossil, but this time it's non food and it's non-indirect or low indirect land use change. Uh, so this means we have to use essentially a waste resource. So uh, one of the uh, prevalent uh, suggestions for this, and it's a good suggestion, is to use liquid fuels and biomass, uh, very rich in hydrogen carbon, quite close to the fuel in terms of composition. The question is can we remove the oxygen in liquid cellulose, about a third of the mass of oxygen. That's no good in fuel. It's a low energy density. Uh, ingredient and also really compatibility with uh, infrastructure requirements. We have to remove the oxygen, so this is a challenge. Second challenge, um, which really uh, informs the strategy for fuel synthesis, is affordability. Okay? The, the item, the material, the fuel, it has to work technically, and that's a science challenge, and it's difficult enough, but it also has to be in some way close to cost competitive uh, with petroleum. That's really difficult. Um, so we have here a COPEX, uh, an OPEX analysis uh, for first generation and some prototypical advanced biofuels. Uh, gasoline, diesel here that's on the market right now for petroleum is about 40 cents per liter. So this is what we have to get to in terms of making our product. And you can see uh, the estimates we have in the out of COPEX and OPEX, OPEX and OPEX uh, for various uh, fuel production technologies are all much higher than that and also very uncertain. And so when you sit down and consider this, uh, you come to conclusions pretty quickly. Uh, the first one is your best sense, you can use a high grade feedstock. Something very rich in hydrogen, very rich in carbon, low oxygen, um, and that basically means a fat or an oil, um, which although in red two the new red directive, it is legal, it's penalized the coefficient of two. Okay? Um, I, in the medium term, don't see this being sustainable. It's really a limited supply of fat and oil out there. So right now we're using U15 uh, oil and hydrogen 15, so adding hydrogen to U15 oil. Not really a scalable process. Uh, the other prospect is to make simple fuels um, that with a molecular structure design to give some uh, performance advantage uh, to the biofuel. And this can in some way compensate for uh, using a lower grade fuel. What that means is we have to design a very simple process uh, for the reason that it's 
simple, they will be cheap to implement. So this is what we try to do. So our research strategy here uh, is being uh, to make an advanced biofuel, and we want to do that because there are two components. Uh, the technicality of the biofuel production uh, from renewable feedstocks, uh, but also uh, the fuel cameras, the combustion planes. I know that we can design functionalities in the biofuel molecules that will make uh, the fuel perform better at the end. So it's a double research flow um, from the feedstock side and from the utilization side, and then a product flow from the feedstock side. Okay, so we use lignol cellulose. And, uh, so these are, in this country, <coughs> things like forestry wastes, other countries like gas, uh, waste plant matter, okay, the stuff that's left over after we take food away. Um, principally, we're interested in the cellulose, but also the hemicellulose. So, in a general way, for most big stuff, that's about two thirds of the mass. And then another third or 20% or so is lignin, and that's harder to valorize. I won't talk about that today. Um, okay, so we look around the technology. It's a very simple chemistry. Um, we know uh, after hydrolysis, so uh, the aqueous phase reaction of a carbohydrate, in this example, uh, with a hydrogen atom. Um, so we know that that works very well to one of the cellulose, hemicellulose, to uh, any number of sugars that are comprised in the original feedstock. And the hydrate cation then can also uh, hydrate, uh, dehydrate uh, the sugar to form this platform molecule, which is called hydroxymethyl perforol, or HMS. Um, and that's thermodynamically uh, downhill uh, with water with lignic acid and formic acid in a very quantitative yield, so it's very intensive. Uh, so this provides, provides a template for what we might want to try to do. Um, why not just use lignic acid? This is a very low HC ratio. The performance criteria for a fuel HC ratio is the of the energy density. A lot of oxygen is not, not compatible, and that's also quite the same as the name would suggest. So we can't use the right gas, but perhaps we can functionalize it somehow. So the idea is that in water, if you take the example of propofurinones, um, propofurinones will dehydrate and hydrate down to the right gas. If we perform the same process in a different salt, if we need to solubilize the feedstock to reduce the reaction, we're using a homogenous acid, so it's all in the space. Um, if we can use ethanol, cheap and abundant, uh, hydrogen rich, uh, alkylated maybe, uh, it forms the role, the nice role of uh, the solvent agent and also the functionalized agent. So the hypothesis is that rather than getting a little lignic acids and hydroxymethyl porphyrol, we don't zip this to get a module called ethylethylethyl porphyrol, basically added an ethyl group to HMS, and a module called ethylethylethylethylethylethyl. So if you're a fuel chemist, and I did some of my PhD work here on ethylethylethyl biodiesel, that molecule right there was just like ethylethylethyl biodiesel in the ketone stuff at the end. So initially, we're quite hopeful that this can work. So this is what we try to do. Okay, so we have a system like this. Uh, Lignin cellulose, we know that we can make cellulose from that, and we know we can get sugars from cellulose quite affordably. Uh, the question is, can we uh, functionalize the sugar uh, by the reaction of ethanol to give it that biofuel component? And there's a number of different routes we might use to do that, potentially isomerizing glucose and fructose, and uh, taking advantage of uh, different functionality of fructose from the sugar of ethanol. Okay, so there are a lot of questions we have to answer. So, is area CRL work for us? Uh, the questions would be, what sugars can we use? Can we use cellulose itself? Can we use biomass itself? Um, what products do we get? Do we get what we can can? What are our wastes? Are the wastes expensive to remove? All of those things kill the cost, and we don't have a cost group to play with. Can we use other solvating or oxidating agents to build out the whole work? Um, and then what about the energetics? Uh, how much energy do we put in to run this process to get it to work? So what is the energy time wave dependence of the reaction? I won't answer all of those for you today, but we're we'll investigating all those issues. So we do some initial uh, screening experiments. Um, for example, water issue type arrangements. We parameterize uh, the concentration of sugar, looking at glucopyranose and glucopyranose, acid concentration over a range of temperatures. Okay, and this is what we get. This is a simple comparison. On the top, uh, we have fructose. Uh, we see that it quickly goes away. Uh, ethoxy methylperforol quickly forms, and then there's a slower conversion of ethoxy methylperforol to the target molecule ethyl here. 
final rounds, uh, it's a similar mechanism, we think. Um, uh, the blue goes all the way, it's immediately ethylated to form a one molecule here, or one isomer shown of ethyl glucoside. We speculate that ethyl glucose can be on a number of tissues, we'll talk about the mechanism in a moment. Uh, but then that also dehydrates to so a molecule of formic acid to make uh, our target molecule ethyl level in it. Yields are 55% of the glucose quantitative, uh, but not all the mass uh, ends up there or any chemical process where we would like it. We have a very complicated mechanism, and an interest of mine since uh, being here as an undergraduate has always been about what's happening uh, in the class, never about the in textbook, so it's much more complicated than that. We've measured a lot of things, uh, so there's a complicated play. Um, I'll back that up with some calculations in a moment. Uh, but to the chemical engineer, what matters is how much of the resource did you get into your finished cost. So we get about 60% of the glucose mass into the antenna product. We lose about 40%. So the solid black line here is the mass balance. And there's a deficit. There's a deficit in uh, not just the glucose, that's the book that accounts for it, um, but also in the alkylating agent, the ethanol. So there are two competing processes happening. Uh, the first form is the formation of the protocol of the species. It's a condensable organic polymer that looks something like this. So it's speculated in the literature by us to be many H mechanisms joined together. Okay, so increasing the yield of this can rely on understanding how this is formed and getting away from the rope. Okay, so they, they're black and soluble polymers. So we're getting about 40% of that stuff, 60% of our advanced biofuel components. The other process, which is very interesting if you're a fuel chemist, is that uh, the ethanol is also reacting with gas. Okay? Not as you would intend, but of course it happens. Um, so we see the ethanol going away, and it gets dimerized quantitatively as the diethylether. So this could be a waste, um, as you know the fuel. If you know your fuels, you'll think that this is a very interesting thing, because diethylether is the only diesel fuel actually. Okay? Even more interesting than that, ethanol, as you probably know, is added to our gasoline and petrol here, that's very widely across the world. There's a very high octane number, so it's advantages to the gasoline. Diethylether is totally different. It has a very high cetane number, which is the quality needed for a diesel fuel. So we have actually a process here to advantage our, our uh, advanced biofuels even further, that we have not just ethanol and ethyl ethyl in it, but we also have diethylether form. So we have three fuel components a mixture and at the end of the of the experiment. So we've shown just a little bit of the no combustion ice here, uh, but a little bit of combustion chemistry um, for the audience. As uh, the kinetics are different, so the kinetics of the uh, sugar to ethyl ethylene process it goes in one way, uh, and the kinetics of ethanol dimerization to diethylene occurs in another way. So we actually see that the reaction progresses. The emission quality, so the fuel property, the legal fuel property uh, of our mixture changes as a function of time. So just by modifying the length of time that we perform the reaction for, or time temperature to the rate, uh, we can adjust this composition to form a gasoline compatible fuel, and um, even a drop in for replacement, or a diesel compatible for replacement fuel. And um, so we've done engine tests on this. Uh, these are blending diagrams, uh, so low fraction. Uh, here will be 100% ethyl ethyl in this corner, 100% ethanol at that one, and 100% diethyl ether at this one. So the engine test shows you can just see this big white line here. If you walk along the, the white line, any uniform mixture along that line is going to be, in this example, uh, compatible with drop and diesel fuel. A different uh, white line, different blending fraction, uh, so in the lower half of the uh, blending triangle here, anything along that white line, Compatible with uh, drop in petrol or gasoline. So it's very nice for those benefits. Okay, so as I said, the interest uh, in the science, a lot of the science interest for me has always been about the mechanism, what's happening uh, to the molecules. Uh, so we do some theoretical calculations to try and evidence uh, the propositions that we showed you today in terms of what's happening. Um, the quantum chemistry and solution is difficult. Uh, because you have uh, solvent molecules all around the solvent, 
generic or different alcohol that we use. Um, and then mechanistically, uh, we see a complicated system involving at least uh, four competitive isomers of the protein group parallel in the end of Okay, so just to acknowledge Hong Ming um, from Transformation Ireland and, and, and SEAI, and then uh, the, the hardworking students, so the two doctoral students who are in the course, Thomas and Nicole. Um, Monique Ghosh is actually joining you in Galway in a couple of weeks in the recurrence team, and he will be around and my co-worker at the University of Wilmer. Um, the real reason I came here to advertise the postdoctoral <laughs> I seek a talented hardworking chemist uh, who is motivated to resolve these energy carbon dioxide issues. And uh, we need help to commercialize this. So if you're interested, you may need to contact me uh, uh, your email. So I'll try to answer any questions.
everything is difficult. It's difficult to do the installation. There are a lot of things in there. Uh, the purification of the walls is about 25% of your office costs. You've got to purify. That's number one. Number two is for like the art of the online. We did a lot of work. Um, the, the second limitation, and um, what we designed from the very beginning, uh, to get to drop the fuel economically. Okay, so these aviation fuels are very high grade fuel. They're complete hydrocarbon. Hydrogen carbon. That's what fossil fuel is. Okay? Those are very technically high grade fuel. They perform well in the engine, they perform well in the infrastructure, they don't evaporate, they're well stored. Okay. So what you don't want to have to do to biomass is add hydrogen that adds about another twenty percent to your operational cost. So the answer to the question is don't have to avoid purification and avoid hydrogenation. And um, so we do have to do a little bit of purification. We can do that, we have to do a water and we do a membrane for that. Um, you got to keep it simple. So hydrogenation and purification. Your questions to the 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 So we want to move on to our next speaker. So um, the next speaker is Maria Chu, um, who is possibly a graduate. <laughs> so Maria is graduate of NYU at Galway and subsequently went on to post up in. in Ghent, Hamburg, and in Galway, um, and since we were appointed a uh, lecturer in biochemistry, and she's principal professor at the head of the Molecular Global Biotechnology Group, um, and Maria is going to talk to us about dialogue, debate, and devastation, which I think wins prizes for the uh, climate this morning. <laughs> Thank you. 
about spreading down plant biomass of plant individuals. We're talking effectively about trying to crack open the plant cell wall structure, which as we know, and as Zoe would have mentioned, is very much a defense, um, a, a defense organ, as it were, for the plant. Now, in this context, it's a very complicated industry. You have cellulose, which in itself is a simple power, is very complicated because of the high hydrogen model. It's also impenetrable. You have pectins, you also have chemical minerals that get here, and you have got lithium. So we see that if we look at plant biomass, almost 70% of plant biomass is carbohydrate, complex carbohydrate. Now fungi have to have efficient enzyme systems. It can basically reduce the polymers to oligomers, sorry, to oligomers. And in turn, these oligomers then they reduce them to simple building blocks. Their strategy here is to act as nutrients, but in application, these are harmful to the plant. So when we look at the plant cell wall, um, again, we have complexity because we have different types of carbohydrates in the first cell wall layer, the primary cell wall layer. We also have glycoproteins, and I know we will have mentioned around the galactin proteins, but we've also got flax. In the second cell wall, we have cellulose, but we've also got different matrix polymer backgrounds here, and we've got lithium. So this mixture of materials requires different <coughs> types of enzymes, different enzyme systems, and a quite a range of different tools for fungi. So if we look just at one of those, um, one of those carbohydrates, xylans, one category. So for just to break down xylans in the Xylan looks like this. It's a pentose sugar backbone with several types of substituents. So we have sugar substituents and we have non sugar substituents. We've also got acetate. Uh, so the enzymology, in terms of the concept of a fungi, we have to do, they have to produce a lot of enzymes that can basically remove these fibers but also can fragment the backbone into simple building blocks. So we have a range of backbone acting enzymes and we have these accepting enzymes. So in the context of the work that we've done, in my own um, PhD thesis, I worked very much on one organism. And again, was, the, the work we were doing was at the leading edge um, internationally because this is a big question. How did from the break down and so what is that from? So what we found is this one organism in there that has produced a whole lot of multiple backbone feeding enzymes and also multiple testing enzymes as well. So what did this what did this question mean for us? Well in actual fact what we found was that some of these enzymes were very important because they cooperate with each other to release and to very effectively hydrolyze the solid. But we also had um, <coughs> I suppose we also needed to test this a little bit further. And we were trying to identify, well, if we have 14 of these vitamins, what does this actually mean? All 14 of them, it seems like a lot of energy for a cell to expend to produce 14 of them would apparently be the same stuff. So we actually needed to look at um, other substrates, other materials to test the technology. And this is a little link in again to the villain and legacy in, in uh, Norway because what we actually did was in, we, we isolated those other substrates. We didn't have them, we had to make them, we had to isolate them, extract them. And one of those substrates we extracted was from um, algae, holding the, it's a linear vial, but it was able to give us some more information about the enzymes in the track of that one. So as I said, it's present in red algae, and the extraction mechanism followed was a dilute acid extraction, recover, um, followed by ethanol purification, and we followed the method exactly that was published by Professor Dillon here. And the nice thing about this was that we actually got a very good yield. And I put the bucket up here because we literally we extracted the seaweed in a bucket and we extracted the polymer that way. And we tested the various collaborations to look to the basic system structure analysis, conserve the structure and analysis analysis on it. And then we used it in our own research to actually characterize the um, Cancer, the cancer <coughs> more detail. Um, just to say that this history of extracting out the polysaccharide has continued in the lab, and Rosario was talking later um, about some bioactive polysaccharides that were extracting and were working on some brown acids. Now, this is the paper we followed, so this is what we're going to actually um, put this up in the 
very interesting computation, very difficult to say, very, very good. So what we found was that, and um, after we did our studies, and uh, we found that we took a key observation that fungi produced their enzymes in a time stacked way. So we found that we also had multiplicity, that is the enzymes, nature enzymes or accessory enzymes. And um, we looked at this not only in the modern organisms but also in other fungi, and we found that the enzymes were different specificity. So in other words, there were differences in terms of how they acted in different types of dye Now in later work, this work has made sense. Because what we were finding was um, two key differences. So the synergy between the accessory enzymes and the main chain enzymes were also observed. And these are the main take home facts, um, take home results that we had. We also found that there was synergy between enzyme systems for degradation of cellulose and other nature and that way. But there was a whole lot of questions that came out of this work that has led to some of the more recent work. So what we wanted to know is why did these fungi produce multiple enzymes that seem to be the same function? And again, um, you know, was it due to gene splicing? Was it actually due to uh, just the fact that there were multiple proteins, multiple genes in the genome? Was it due to post translation modification? Was it due to bonds of the enzymes? Um, and the applications involving um, the, the applications that we, we did were we still going to introduce the question. We didn't know what. Reality of the 
Bison and the Cat, the vacation is very clever, the dance is abundant, and the fun is going to be an important feature for the cat. Now, this is important when we're looking at the profiling of the scale of dominated by the family, scale of destruction of cats. Understanding the monsters that are involved in the style may provide very important technological uh, advances in terms of cat destruction. The dance thing, the biophobic quickly can actually be the And when we look at what happens, um, these, these organisms are already being used for the child, um, and they, some of the innovations of the child, in terms of how they can actually work to can be used to improve um, crop production for the bison family. So, these organisms and the bison family form what we call the symbiosis. But what we notice with them is that they do not produce artillery or arsenic or artillery or cancer or plastic. They, they may release some oligosaccharides, <coughs> but they tend to kind of limit the damage to the plant. And the plant has to survive in order for them to be able to engage in the dialogue between <coughs> the fungus base, the plant and the fungus. The contrast they inflict with the necrotrophic fungus is we see that these organisms produce a raft of destructive enzymes. So this is where the destruction comes in. There's no dialogue, there's no detent, this is destruction. All other things can work out here. And the result is extended cell wall degradation. So they the target the polymers and the replacement are. So when we look at this from a proteinosis point of view, we actually have been trying to identify our particular enzymes, our particular proteins that are involved in this process, and how can we understand the difference the, uh, the mycorrhizal fungi, the saccharidic fungi, and also the necrotrophic fungi. So what we find here, this, this study was done by Lopresti, and um, we find that the dark blue line here is the, I suppose, the, the, the components of plants that are more degraded in them, produced by necrotrophs, and uh, necrotrophs and myotrophs and saccharidic And we can see that they're quite similar. So the saccharides are the really efficient recyclers, but they actually do they have a very uh, important gene, but they do not make oxidative cells. <coughs> what we also notice here is that there's lots of proteins, some proteins that we don't have any function for, we don't know what the function actually is. And um, we see that some of the other formulas that established biotropes and symbiotic relationships seem very low, at least with respect to very low levels of plants and water related plants. So part of the puzzle that we've been trying to find out is what function are these other proteins? And this could be where so we can improve biomass progression and how can we basically go about using those enhanced processes. So just to highlight some work we did in the lab ourselves, we've actually been looking at revisiting some proteins, finding proteins that don't have the mass function. And one protein here is a swollen protein. Now this protein acts to prize open the and originally it was so important to prize open the cellulose structure. But what we've actually found is that it maps very closely with plant extensin. So it's actually almost like this, the fungus is mimicking some of the plants in terms of how it's working. And we see that in the presence of the swollen protein, the cellulose fibers are, they're, they're quite densely degraded or they're in a really difficult plant here in comparison with a non-digestive or a, a swollen fiber with enzymes without the um, without the swollen protein. So what we see then with this sorry, with this um, with, with, with this protein though, and this is the first discovery, we actually tend to use some duty in with other enzymes, side enzymes and the enzymes. And what we found here, and this was again the first report, is that we found that this protein also cooperates with the enzymes that are involved in the matrix in the food construction. So in actual fact, these proteins, some of these binding proteins, they could be really useful in terms of overall detachment of the So in our own work, we've actually been <coughs> investigating some other plant factors that might come into the equation and looking to see what impact they have on the profile of proteins that are produced by mass so what we see here is that in the control where we don't add any transactors, we have the usual types of enzymes we would expect. But where we add in some plant factors, we see that we, oh, see, oh, 